So, welcome to this lecture on advanced digital system design in the course uh, digital system design with uh, PLDs and FPGAs. At the last lecture we have started with uh, the effect of metastability in sequential circuit and data path. Uh, we could not uh, we did not spend much time on uh, how the metastability happens in in an uh, in a flip flop or latch or anything like that though briefly I mentioned uh, the cause of it uh, in a gist. Uh, essentially our focus was to look at the effect of metastability in sequential circuit and data path and how to handle uh, that situation. Uh, so, that uh, the, the proper operation of the circuit is not impaired. Um, definitely analyzing uh, the metastability in detail starting with the cross couple latch. Uh, <coughs> moving to uh, kind of edge triggered flip flop and all will bring clarity, uh, but uh, due to lack of time uh, we will set that aside and focus on the uh, what is useful for the design of the digital system we will handle it that is a plan. So, let us run through the slides we have uh, looked at uh, the, the last lecture. So, uh, we know that in an edge triggered flip flop for the data to uh, appear at the output from the input. The input data has to satisfy some timing requirement with respect to the clock edge, active clock edge. The data has to arrive sometime before that is called setup time. <coughs> Not only that it has to remain at the input after the clock edge for a while that time is called the duration is called hold time. If that happens then from the clock edge with a delay the output appears ok. And this I said if you analyze a master slave flip flop which from which this edge triggered um, uh, flip flop is constructed um, we, during the negative for a positive edge triggered uh, flip flop during the negative clock period the master is in transparent mode. So, the setup time would normally mean uh, the from the active clock edge that is from uh, when the master is going to be cut off from the input um, the, the, the actually the minimum time required for that latch to set because uh, that is when uh, the latest the input can change. Uh, if afterwards if the input changes there is not enough time to set the master latch. So, that is what is the setup time of course. Uh, normally in the clock path there will be inverters uh, to choose the correct polarity and uh, to choose the opposite edge for the slave and all that. So, there will normally there will be uh, two inverters. So, that inverter skew has to be removed from the setup and uh, the whole time is that inverter delay itself because uh, even after the, the clock going high it take uh, that inverter delay for the master to cut off that is a hold. So, during that time the data should not change and uh, when uh, the positive clock edge comes the slave get the copy of the master slave is enabled and the master is disabled. So, uh, for the time for slave to set is the propagation delay normally the again there will be an inverter that delay has to be added with the, the latch delay slave latch delay for the the propagation delay. So, that is the essence of this setup hold and propagation delay, uh, but um, again in a basic course many a times you are told that if this is met uh, the input is captured at the output um, kind of um, truthfully, um, but many a times it is not discussed what happens uh, if it is violated ok. So, many things can happen as we said. Um, if the setup and hold time is violated uh, kind of uh, the flip flop can miss trigger that means suppose the previous value was 0 and was trying to set to 1 it may remain in 0 or it may kind, kind of set to 1 ok. Now, um, so it, it means that you are not you are not really sure what the output is going to be it could be 0 or 1, uh, but as I said normally it is not a dangerous situation as long as input persists uh, for at least 
uh, two clock periods then um, uh, definitely in the next clock edge everything will be okay because it will meet the setup and hold time and then uh, the data is captured uh, at the output properly okay. So, mistriggering itself is not a very serious issue, but the second effect is that um, that it might take longer time to resolve it. That means, if the data changes close to the active clock edge it will take long time for it to settle and that is dangerous because um, like we have in a sequential circuit we find the minimum clock period and once you decide that if um, the data uh, the output takes longer to settle then it can violate the setup and hold time at the, the destination register. Not no, no issue with this flip flop, but it is driving something at that destination register it can it can upset the setup whole time. And the worst effect would be uh, that this output can get stuck to a voltage level which is not neither 1 nor 0 it will be in between and that can drive the uh, any circuit not even flip flop it can even drive the combination circuit into active region the gate and that will act as amplifier any slight noise it will start switching it will dissipate a lot of power maybe it is taken care in the design uh, depending on how you design, but definitely um, uh, this is quite uh, disastrous uh, that it gets stuck in between and the worst thing is that um, we cannot definitely say when it will come out of it. We can only say about the probability. So, that means um, it can remain there for a long time when we talk about probability that does not kind of preclude uh, chances of it getting stuck for a say 5 second or 5 minutes or anything like that. Though we talk about the probability uh, you should you should remember that, but that happening often uh, when the probability is low uh, may not happen, but then um, like the probability is probability. So, you should not have kind of um, a deterministic view on the probabilistic events that should be kept in mind. So, let us come to that uh, the effect of it, but uh, in a sequential circuit or in a data path we take care of all these we like we choose the proper clock period to meet the, the setup time, we um, analyze the effect of the skew, we analyze the effect of hold time and the skew effect on both we will consider though we have not discuss that in the in our lectures, but we will be doing that when I take the FPGA part of the course. Um, so, in a data path we do the maximum frequency analysis whole time violation. Uh, similarly, in a, in a FSM we do both and um, then when um, the metastable can happen in this circuit is a question and we said yes. Uh, there could be inputs directly coming to this combination circuit in a data path. There could be inputs coming to the first stage of the data path maybe the, this continues you know there is registers combination circuit registers combination circuit and so on. But at some point somewhere some data from the external world or the data path comes in and in an FSM there are inputs mainly this is from the, the data path, but we are not sure. Uh, the frequency of the clock uh, from where this input is coming okay it may not be same. So, or it could be a some process which is generating a logic value like a limit switch uh, which has no relation with the clock many a times and then these inputs may not meet the setup and hold time as far as this input is concerned it may not meet the setup and hold time. And as far as this is concerned it may not meet the setup and hold time. This latency as I said is a matter of shifting it does not affect the probability of any particular input you know getting uh, creating metastability in this flip flop. Similarly about this so uh, the problem as far as a sequential circuit or a data path is concerned the asynchronous input is the one which can cause metastability. So, once again though we have learned metastability our concentration 
as far as sequential circuit and data path is concerned should be on um, inputs which are not synchronous ok. So, uh, if you are a good designer uh, that there you should focus your attention the inputs coming from an asynchronous domain ok that should be handled properly that is where the, the crux of the, uh, uh, the problem ok that is like asynchronous inputs. So, um, when we say asynchronous input it will be an in, input which is generated as a uh, on a flip flop or a register with a different clock or a process which is not synchronized to the sequential circuit. So, very very easy to answer this question that the, the problem is that the input is asynchronous. So, the, the solution is to synchronize it and uh, it is again we do not know probably at the beginning uh, you do not know how to synchronize, but it is very easy. Suppose there was an asynchronous input which was going to this combination circuit and reaching a destination register. Uh, the way to synchronize is that you connect that input asynchronous input to a D flip flop clocked by the same clock as the sequential circuit and the Q is connected here. Now, what happens is that uh, the D is captured by this and appears with a delay. Now, any time D changes uh, this is captured at the Q with a delay of uh, propagation delay TCO and that you know transmit through the uh, propagate through the combination circuit reach here. So, if the clock period is chosen properly um, in the next positive edge here uh, this input uh, that means the output of this synchronizing flip flop will meet the setup time and whole time there should not be a problem. And of course, um, the input which is synchronized will reach uh, at this destination register with a latency or a delay of one clock period. So, that is a penalty we pay um, a penalty in terms of time that there is a latency and, and penalty in terms of the area which is a flip flop ok. So, nothing comes free. Um, so, you suffer in uh, delay and suffer in the area ok that you should know. Now, uh, as I said we have not solved the problem uh, in a very um, kind of foolproof way. Earlier um, there were chances of all these or some of these flip flops getting into metastability. Now, um, there is no guarantee that this will meet the setup and hold time of this uh, flip flop because this is asynchronous with respect to this clock. So, this can get into metastability ok. Now, that is better than the earlier case, but like we are kind of sampling the asynchronous input in one point, but earlier it was sampled by different flip flops and maybe some will get into metastability, some will not, some will miss trigger. It was it was a mess ok. It was uh, you could not say what is the kind of what is happening uh, at the output you know some could be 1, some could be 0, some could be in metastability and so on ok. Though uh, the way I say um, uh, you might think that it occurs so frequently it does not ok. Uh, but you know that that is the I want to highlight the problem of sampling and asynchronous input at multiple places with different path delay ok. That is issue, um, but our hope is that if this synchronizing flip flop get into metastability by the next clock edge if it comes out of it and if there is enough time for it to propagate through combination circuit and meet the setup time at the destination register it is ok ok. So, that is a real um, hope. But uh, like this I want to state I can only kind of make a statement we have not uh, we are not going to analytical part of it. Um, the fact is that the probability of a flip flop remaining in metastability decreases exponentially with time. That means, if this synchronizing flip flop get into metastability as the time passes the chances of it coming out. Uh, becoming exponentially more. So, every nanosecond you give extra it is an exponential increase 
um, in the probability of it coming out of the, uh, uh, the metastability. Again uh, I warn you it is a probability uh, I mean it is not certain like you cannot say um, after you give 1 nanosecond extra it is surely um, now with a double chance it is going to uh, come out it may it may remain there okay there is what there is a kind of logical problem in the last sentence uh, but um, like i i hope you got the uh, the picture so the the idea is that we give enough time for the the synchronizing flip flop to come out of the metastability and which from now onwards we can analyze that part the time available for it to come out of metastability is that in this path there is a clock period one clock period a clock comes and before the next clock edge this output should reach here. But now if it get into metastability it should come out propagate and meet the setup time here okay. So how much time is available for it to, to come out of metastability that is the total clock period minus this time for the propagating through the combination circuit minus the setup time at least by then it should come out okay. Suppose the clock period is 10 nanosecond setup time is 1 nanosecond and the combination delay is 4 nanosecond. So the put together it is 5 nanosecond. So we are hoping that within 5 nanosecond after getting into metastability uh, this comes out of it then there is no issue everything goes uh, uh, clean. But that also tells us that if we are able to give more time um, like then there are more chances of it, it coming out of metastability. So it is a question of um, analyzing it finding the probability and checking is that okay like not, not only the probability maybe we have to um, convert that into the rate of um, a metastable kind of uh, failure metastability failure in the sense that it does not come out of metastability or the average time between such failures okay. So if it is large enough and if it occurs very uh, seldom then it is okay okay. So uh, but uh, if that is not okay like you have the metastability resolution time for a single stage is T clock minus T com minus T setup then we have to increase it uh, we cannot kind of. Uh, at least from the, at the outset we should not tamper with the clock period if you reduce it uh, the system will suffer. So we reduce this combination circuit and uh, we are trying to make it 0 and that is by you know that by putting another register in a chain here. So that the output of this flip flop see only a flip flop not a combination circuit. So that is double stage synchronizer. So we put two flip flop. Now the, the time available for this to come out of metastability is clock period minus the setup time okay. But the, uh, the price we pay is a 2 latency, 2 clock period latency. So if something happens here the worst case it will appear here after 2 clock period okay. Uh, that is a uh, and of course in terms of area 2 uh, kind of flip flops. Now suppose if like you as uh, you know kind of assess the probability and find that it is not enough the, the, the mean time between failure is not very large then we will be forced to kind of um, increase the clock period. But then this should not be affected so what we do is that we divide the clock for this part and retain the original clock for this uh, sequential circuit or the data path mean data path. So, uh, that is what is shown here. So you divide by uh, n the clock is coming from here the main clock goes to the sequential circuit divided clock goes to the synchronizer and now we have the, the clock period is n into t clock because we are dividing by n then the clock period increases by n minus setup time. So that should normally solve the problem n is and now the latency is 2 clock period of the divider clock which is nt clock. So 2 nt clock is a latency which can be high but n itself is 2, 3 or 4 things like that not, not a huge number. But I said there is an issue here of a skew because there is a skew between this clock and this clock. This the source registers clock is a delayed 
version of the destination register clock. So like if you put uh, the destination clock like that like that and the source clock is coming delayed okay. So that eat into the available clock period. So available clock period for the propagation will be T clock minus this Q. So um, this part this Q will force uh, one to increase the clock period okay that is not a good idea and we will uh, definitely analyze the effect of skew in the clock period uh, all that in the whole time violation and all that uh, in different scenarios you know there, there could be different scenario depending on where the, which side the clock comes from. So we will analyze all that but at least I want to tell you the problem here. So uh, what we do is that to avoid that we put a D skew flip flop because now the skew come uh, between two adjacent flip flop without any combinate circuit. So it is kind of you know T clock minus Q uh, should accommodate the TCQ and the T setup um, which will be much smaller than uh, this will be much smaller than this which is like this. Suppose if there is a skew here the situation is it is going to eat into the clock period and it, it is going to push push the clock period up okay. So this wouldn't and that is the uh, D skew flip flop definitely it will add uh, latency to the whole process now. Uh, so it will be the latency you can work, work out it is a 2 and T clock plus the T clock because this is not clocked by this uh, kind of output of the, uh, the counter but, uh, but the input of the uh, counter. So uh, that is what we have uh, looked at the last uh, class I have repeated it because it is it is important uh, that should get into your mind um, very clearly and, and this is a kind of standard solution um, almost people treat it as a kind of thumb rule wherever they see um, an asynchronous input they put two flip flop in a chain sometime they put three flip flop okay we will see why three flip flop. Um, I do not quite agree with such kind of thumb rule. Um, like which is like many a times if you ask uh, some people um, like you are sampling an input uh, say the Nikos rate how many times you should sample they will say 10. Um, this 10 is not a magical number you know that we have uh, 10 fingers in the hand. So we and we use a decimal system maybe because we have um, the 10 fingers in the hand because earlier the counting was. Uh, you know based on the, the fingers and uh, we will keep a tally for how many tens and that is how the decimal system uh, you know kind of arose and before that people, people were like even for now for the time we use uh, tall as a base. So there were like DO decimal number system as there. So uh, uh, what I am talking is that uh, my argument is that if we had tall fingers then we will be all, all the time telling. 12 rounding off to 12 everything. So um, just uh, relying on thumb rule for design is a very bad thing and nowadays anyway it does not work because people want very optimized um, uh, circuits in terms of area, power dissipation, delay and so on. But you should as a designer you should not resort to these kind of um, uh, the magical tricks uh, which, is, which is told by other people to do that where whenever you see an asynchronous inboard two flip flops or three flip flops without any questions asked not a good idea at least when you are working in a CMOS technology you know uh, the, uh, the kind of um, the delays you can expect in that technology and from there you go back and analyze it is uh, the data is difficult to come by for metastability analysis. But I am hoping that you can get it at least um, look at some uh, the published work on that and um, you know assure yourself that uh, the scheme you put is, is uh, enough or it is not kind of you are not over designing and so on like where you uh, the two uh, double stage is enough do not put multiple stage cycle multiple cycle synchronizer and so on. So let us come back to it instead of multiple cycle synchronizer sometime people put a kind of cascaded synchronized that means they will put three flip flop in a chain, four flip flop in a chain and so on. Uh, the argument is that uh, like uh, say you can work out the probability like if you know the 
the frequency of the clock and uh, the setup and hold time window width and if you know the rate of change of the asynchronous input because this need not be kind of a uh, regular uh, square uh, wave. So, the average rate or the maximum rate whatever depending on average rate should be good enough to take and then you can find out the rate of metastability entry. Then um, knowing the time that the fact that it will as you give more time the, the probability of it coming out increases exponentially with time. So, the probability of it remaining there decreases exponentially with time ok. So, from there we can find out what is the, the rate at which the second flip flop can get into metastability and again do the same analysis for the second flip flop. Then you know what is the rate at which uh, the third is, is kind of getting. But so this you know that the probability gets multiplied and the chances are becoming less and less for uh, you know when you come towards the real sequential circuit uh, the probability of that the last flip flop getting into metastability is very 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 less. So, the mean time between failure will be a huge uh, numbers in terms of maybe uh, millions of years that should be good enough for uh, large number of products uh, which you make out of that design ok. So, that is a basic idea about the cascaded uh, synchronizer. The probability of metastable output reduces multiplicate multiplicatively that means uh, that remaining in metastability reduces multiplicatively at each stage of the cascaded synchronizer. So, some people do this instead of and it does not matter you know to, to be very frank um, like here like if you assume uh, 4 flip flops ok. So, you have a latency of 4 here ok and you are using um, uh, kind of 4 flip flops and if you go back to this and you, you put a divide by 4 counter mode 4 counter then use 2 flip flops the latency is 2 and t clock which is nothing but the 4 clock cycle of this. So, essentially uh, kind of uh, things are uh, you know similar um, there is no difference it is a matter of kind of some some choice only thing is that maybe this introduces a skew, but in the in the cascaded there is no skew. So, many times when you see uh, some kind of uh, solutions. Um, uh, at least uh, the, the the theoretically sometime it all means the same though the argument the structure is different. So, one should look at it and try to, to make uh, sense out of it ok. Now, let us look at uh, the effect of asynchronous input to FSM. Now, I, I must warn you saying that um, there is no reason for you not to synchronize an asynchronous input in a very serious uh, design. Uh, maybe this concern is little bit too old where uh, one used to use kind of discrete kind of devices where a flip flop can be very costly. Maybe putting two flip flop will um, will end up you will end up using a kind of a 20 pin or 24 pin dip package which occupies, but nowadays the, the SOC chips are uh, you know it, it is so small and there is so much density of transistors or gates not a problem not much of a problem, but then it is nice to analyze at least uh, academically we learn something um, uh, in, in a complex situation what is the effect of uh, the asynchronous input that is the only thing. So, I would suggest that if there is an asynchronous input synchronize it rather than applying these techniques which I am going to say. So, assume that uh, this enable is an asynchronous input to a state machine and uh, the state machine is like that as long as it is low remain there. If it is high transit to this state with 1 1. Now mind you there are 2 uh, flip flops q 1 and q 0 and now the situation is that we are not synchronizing. This asynchronous input is going to the input of q 1 uh, that flip flop and the 0 flip flop ok. Now, uh, because of the path delays um, difference in path delays this will be sample at different point in time and you can imagine sometime may it may happen that uh, the q 1 transit to 1 and q 0 remain there because it is asynchronous or the opposite can happen um, 
the q1 remain in 0 that means it is mistriggered uh, it retain the previous value but the q0 has transited. So it may happen that instead of the valid state 1 1 when the clock comes it transit to an kind of uh, invalid uh, you know state 1 0 or 0 1 and we do not know about this state and this could be kind of uh, you know some state within the state machine state diagram or it could be unused state whatever it is dangerous. This is not like output races where it goes briefly there and come back it really mystical. So you can imagine that you, you have a very complex state machine which loops and branches and all that suddenly uh, you find that it is in some state and soon you find that the, the state machine is elsewhere and it continues from there and it is quite dangerous. So you should never uh, suppose if you are not synchronizing the solution is not to do such a kind of assignment you should make it grey code so that only uh, one of the flip flop change. So even if there is a missed trigger it does not matter either it will remain 0 0 or it will transit to 0 1. So always do a go or no go like enable bar remain there enable go there but this should be grey coded if you are using an asynchronous input. Um, the similar situation can happen um, when the state machine is in say 0 0 and enable is an asynchronous input when it is uh, 1 you transit to 0 1 when it is 0 uh, the machine transit to 1 0 okay the, the state machine transit to 1 0. Now since once again since it is we are talking about in this condition when enable is 1 um, q 0 is changing the state when enable is 0 q 1 is changing the state. Now you can imagine that um, this two flip flop sampling um, uh, the, the one input with different path delay. So it may happen that one instead of both changing one might change. So you are end up you are hoping like um, like here uh, sorry here only the, the q1 was changing here only the q0 was changing. But uh, q1 will kind of um, interpret it as 1 and will change and q0 also will interpret it as 1 and change. Then you will end up in another invalid state or and this is quite dangerous again the solution is that never branch on asynchronous input like this like when it is 1 go to some state and 0 goes to other state you should always uh, adopt a go no go structure when it is 1 transit when it is 0 remain there and this should be grey grey coded and as I said always it is even better to synchronize the asynchronous input without much botheration unless it is a very 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 uh, very small circuit you are trying to suppose you are making a 4 bit counter and uh, you have an up down uh, input direction input from somewhere and if you double synchronize the up down and and direction then that will end up using 4 flip flop which is equal to the, the counter flip flop. So, but these situations are uh, rare and if at all you use a 4 bit counter it will be a very small application. So that you should uh, kind of remember. So better to synchronize the synchronous input um, and related to it. So now um, essentially um, uh, what we have covered is the, the how to handle uh, what is metastability, what is its effect on a flip flop and uh, in a sequential circuit and data path how it affects and um, how to I mean where the problem really come in a sequential circuit or uh, in a data path and we said the problem is asynchronous input the solution is to synchronize it. So we have looked at the single state synchronizer, uh, double state synchronizer which improves uh, the reliability or the, uh, the probability uh, aspect is improved. Then multiple cycle synchronizer or cascade uh, synchronizer and we have seen what happens if you use asynchronous input in an FSM uh, to make branching okay. So we have seen one branching with multiple flip flops changing at the same time and one branching 
where um, depending on that input um, it make a decision to go uh, to one side or the other side. So uh, that is uh, that is what uh, we have seen. Now a related um, kind of um, scenario is this something called reset recovery time okay and that is related to the asynchronous reset in a flip flop um, which is a kind of this recovery time the notation is TRC like uh, TREC is a recovery time or TRR okay the RR and REC is the, the subscript. So essentially um, this you would not have kind of um, realized or learned and nevertheless it is a very very important uh, aspect uh, you would have assumed that at least the behavior of an asynchronous reset in a, in a flip flop is that you assert that you make it active with a delay the Q goes to 0 and you remove it then the, the clock comes everything works fine um, is, is what we assumed okay. But there is a, a factor called recovery time that means that the reset recovery time is a minimum amount of time between the deassertion of this signal and the next, uh, next clock edge active clock edge. Suppose the clock is coming uh, the positive clock edge is coming here the reset should, reset should be removed sometime before that okay. Otherwise this output can get into metastability okay and this is quite serious because um, in, a, in a digital circuit there could be um, tens of thousands of uh, flip flops okay or hundreds of thousands of flip flops and many a times at the power on a single reset we can reset all the flip flops okay most of the flip flop and it has to be reset because the precisely same reason there is no guarantee that uh, if you power on a, all the flip flops all the outputs are going to be neat you know like during the power on uh, probably it can get into metastability. So reset is essential but if you do not meet the reset recovery time in flip flop um, again the metastability can happen in the and the flip flop. So this is something which is overlooked and um, many times one think of the assertion of the, the reset not the deassertion that is a problem like um, we are not asking the right question when you assert it fine uh, the, the, the reset is driving the internal latches you know that that is uh, the problem like um, in an edge to gut flip flop you have a master um, latch and a slave latch as I said that is and this reset asynchronous reset is directly going to the master latch and slave latch and resetting it and, and you can look at the, uh, the, the circuit diagram for it then you will realize why that happens okay. Again um, in this course I do not have time to go into the details of that because it will eat up into our time. So, when that means they are they are driving the master and slave latch directly not going through this clock gating you know that is why it is asynchronous. As soon as you assert with a delay um, uh, this is reset the output is reset and the clock does not matter because it is going directly into the latch and what the clock does is that it gates the input to the, um, uh, to the master latch and so on. So we are bypassing that but now when you remove it it may happen that you are kind of uh, this is being input is driving the master latch and it is nearing that setup time uh, it is close to that minimum time required for it to set up and you are messing it with through the reset it is trying to set through the, uh, the D and we are removing it we, we, we have driven it to 0 but we are removing it very close to the clock edge. So then this will not have enough time to set it up. So this should be uh, and how much time is not the setup time because this is directly going to the latch. So this is the uh, kind of reset recovery is the time delay of that path 
um, where this reset is going and kind of um, resetting the latch okay that path like if you analyze the details circuit you can find a reset recovery time in terms of the gates involved and so on okay. But I hope you get a, a picture of the situation okay that is that's a problem like you, you can assert at any time with a delay it will be a kind of reset because it directly going it does not matter. But when you remove it and it is near the positive clock head near the setup time then um, uh, this uh, thing can get into metastability because um, two drives are there and this does not have enough time uh, to drive it to the proper value. So, this can get into metastability. So, this has to be met and that is now um, so the you, you would see that most people most vendors um, or designers would advise you to use synchronous reset because it is safe okay. But uh, there is an like nice feeling about asynchronous reset uh, saying that uh, like uh, the, the outputs the flip flops are reset without uh, a one clock period delay because in the case of synchronous reset there could be a the worst case one clock period delay for it to reset okay. So, if you want to reset something very quickly even before that for whatever reason maybe for uh, kind of reliability fault tolerance or uh, critical situation whatever uh, this may be good. So, now um, I know understanding the reset recovery what is the solution okay. Now, if you say kind of okay let us synchronize the uh, asynchronous reset um, then it is like synchronous reset only because um, what synchronous reset do we do it outside it, it, it really it meets this kind of reset recovery time but then um, it, it is a synchronous reset the behavior is synchronous because you assert the, uh, the reset it comes with a 1 clock period delay or worst case 1 clock period delay it is like uh, the, the synchronous reset. But we can say uh, this with certainty. So, let us not synchronize the, uh, the leading edge but let us synchronize the trailing edge because if you do not uh, synchronize the leading edge as soon as you assert it the reset happens. And the problem is about removing it uh, uh, nearing uh, near to the clock edge. So, if you synchronize to the clock edge it is removed after the clock edge and it will definitely meet the recovery time at the next clock edge. So, that is the idea. So, um, that is what um, I have written here to retain the asynchronous reset behavior only the trailing edge of the asynchronous reset should be uh, synchronized. So, that is a game. So, I am showing straight away a possible uh, kind of solution. There are many other, but I am showing the uh, again the simplest one. So, assume there is a power on reset circuitry which has no kind of relation to the clock, it comes. Um, so, if it is kind of going to the asynchronous C set of flip flop, um, then it can cause metastability. So, we are synchronizing it. So, this is a synchronized version of the reset it is an active high reset signal as the name suggests it is active high and you can imagine that this part is a delayed the worst case 2 clock period delayed version. So, now the trailing edge comes much later now what we, we are doing is that we are oaring together ok. So, what happens is that that leading edge come as it is because it is oared with a delayed version but the trailing edge is synchronized version. So, that is that is the clever trick for a active high reset. Now, the same technique I hope you got this we have a double stage synchronizer uh, for the power on reset. So, this is a synchronized version, but both the leading and trailing edges are not synchronized. Now, what we do is that we kind of over the, the original reset. So, that we get the, the leading edge as it is ok. So, it is kind of warring of a pulse with a delayed version of the pulse. So, you get the leading edge as it is and the trailing edge is a synchronized version which comes with a late kind of worst case latency of 2 clock period ok. Now, for the active low signal uh, that means, this is kind of 
like it goes in the opposite direction is 1 then it goes 0 and it come back to 1. So, we do we replace this and OR gate with an AND gate then we have done it ok. So, it is a kind of 0 and a delayed version of 0 you know that for the AND gate any input is 0 the output is 0. So, it is like a, as far as the active low signal is concerned we have studied at the beginning. Um, if you remember we have we have looked at um, the difference between AND function and uh, AND gate ok. Now, this is an AND gate doing an OR function for an active low uh, signal uh, so if for an AND gate the inputs and outputs are active low then it is doing an OR function and we have discussed this in the uh, in the overview when we have kind of done a review of the basics we have done that and that is basically I have told at that point in time that is bringing in the De Morgan theorem into our concept ok. So, this is the circuit for active low reset and naturally when in a chip uh, there are a lot of flip flops to be a kind of uh, reset. So, it is not a good idea that one um, wire uh, you know drive everything you know you need to um, kind of buffer it properly for the because the fan out is limited if suppose the fan out of a gate is kind of uh, say 50 then if there are 1000 then they, you need 20 buffers and now uh, you have to balance it out it is not a good idea that uh, you put a buffer then you drive 20 then again you buffer it. So, everything get delayed in a chain so you do a balance buffering and this goes to however many you want you put it parallelly and these branches dry out subsections uh, of the circuit ok that is what is showing shown here. So, essentially um, what we have looked at in the, in the last few slides are the reset recovery time which is related to the uh, to the metastability. Uh, this is related to the asynchronous reset of a flip flop since the asynchronous reset is kind of driving the, the internal latches directly if there is no problem in driving it but while removing it if uh, the clock edge is kind of um, is, is near to the clock edge then that is the setup path setup time of the input that can kind of um, interact with this um, drive and cause metastability in the uh, in the output of that flip flop. So, the solution is to synchronize, but then it does not have an asynchronous behavior. So, again we said it is fine if you synchronize the, uh, the trailing edge uh, rather than the leading edge and the solution we have looked at is that let us synchronize it, but do an OR function ok. So, in the case of an active high reset we use an OR gate and for the active low reset we use an AND gate and that was uh, uh, the solution. So, uh, kind of I wind uh, this uh, metastability synchronization uh, part here. So, the, the essence is that when you find an asynchronous input um, you have some idea of what is the, uh, the mean time between the failure uh, with regard to the metastability or uh, uh, when there is when you encounter the asynchronous input and do the synchronization. And we have not handled all possible ways of doing synchronization, but this is uh, by far the most uh, useful for useful part at least for a basic course I think that should be good enough. And of course, uh, the reset recovery again we have discussed what to do which, but this has to be applied kind of uh, without any hesitation whatsoever ok. So, that you can blindly kind of replicate uh, whatever I have told. So, let us move on. Um, so, um, with this I have kind of I am winding up the digital design part of my uh, course. Um, I have given you uh, how to do a hierarchical top down design. We have we have seen an example of a CPU then we have looked at what is data path, what is controller, what is the controller behavior, what is the structure, how to design that structure, how to design a control algorithm whole methodology we have seen. And we have looked at a case study where everything is applied all these uh, principles are applied very 
uh, maybe not a very complex case study but it was a uh, kind of real life uh, uh, case study we have looked at all the, the practical steps then we have looked at the various issues in the finite state machine like uh, power on reset, clock frequency, output racers. Uh, then we have looked at the problem of state assignment, unused states. Um, then we have looked at uh, how to reduce output delay by decoding from next state logic by encoding the output in uh, the, the state bits uh, all that. And then we also have come to this problem of metastability in flip flop. Um, asynchronous input, synchronizing it, reset recovery. So, uh, kind of I have covered and I have given a kind of a, a um, review of your basic, uh, you know, basics you have learned in the, in the, in the undergraduate course so that you are familiar. Uh, so, I think um, with this you should be able to um, kind of make a good design. And we will take case study. Now we have learned VHDL, we are kind of completing that. And now what is remaining is the two devices, uh, device technologies, the programmable logic devices and the field programmable gate array. Okay. Now once I complete that and bit of VHDL, we have not covered the test bench, then we can kind of uh, look at the case studies where uh, we play with the tool, we implement that on a board. I do not have too, many, too much time to show you lot of case studies and so on. But then I will show something that should be enough and um, um, nowadays uh, the people are kind of um, solving lot of problems you know. Um, like uh, uh, say in mathematics the people try to solve all kinds of problem. And Yes, that is good because that makes you quick and that works out in examinations where in a short period of time you are able to solve more number of problems. But in real life many a times uh, that is not the situation that is not that in a fraction of a second you have to solve a problem. Okay, You have to solve a problem um, creatively, elegantly. Uh, without much cause, without m causing harm to the humans, environment and things like that. Okay. And so, uh, if um, when you work out some example case study that should have uh, the real life element in it. It should address all the basic issues involved. So, that then very few case studies are enough instead of doing a lot of projects you know there are some people uh, resume is full of projects you know and uh, that you have, they have done this they have done that. But nobody asks how come in a short time somebody is able to do so many projects and um, understand it well. It is better you do fewer projects fewer things uh, with a greater grasp and uh, kind of a uh, come out with the creative solution, the elegant uh, simple solution you know the, the elegance you know when you say elegant it is a qualitative word you know we cannot kind of put numbers you know how to assess something is elegant but then it appeals that solution appeals something is elegant the music is elegant the way somebody kind of dress is elegant or uh, uh, the, when you look at the nature it is kind of beautiful. And that can be applied that is a little bit qualitative aspect but then um, we are able to judge that something is elegant or not. So, um, that that is just a kind of not justifying the fact that I am not able to kind of do lot of uh, case study I can do it I have enough uh, uh, maybe I can uh, kind of um, do a course full of case study there is no issue I have so much talk with me. So, that is not the point, but that does not uh, educate you, um, uh, increase your depth of knowledge and so on. So, I am trying to balance it out you know now we have I am trying to uh, you know stress on the device technology, the programming language even with the programming language I have emphasized uh, what it means, what this construct means and what equations it creates, what logical structure it creates and so on rather than you know simply dwelling on um, the all kinds of syntax and all kinds of jugglery with the syntax. 
there is no point you know there is for a, a for an expert person even a, a simple tool would suffice you know uh, you have a very good photographer he is, he, he is able to take a good photograph with a with a maybe a simpler camera but given to a novice even the most advanced camera he will not be able to do that okay. that is true with any tool so the sophistication of the tool wouldn't guarantee that what you design will be kind of uh, efficient elegant fault tolerant and all that that comes with expertise the creativity and the the logical thinking and systematic working and all that so that you should uh, keep in mind so uh, my plan is now uh, to complete this programmable logic devices i didn't start it because we will be stuck in between it might take two or three lectures so we, we will handle the evolution of it the historical evolution of it the simple pld's which are very very rarely used nowadays but maybe there is a use in some cases for it and there is a complex pld again um, the the application is limited um, then we will have one part of the the vhdl which is remaining is the the test bench and there is another part called functions and procedure if time permits i'll take it but it is it's it's one part of the uh, the language wherein uh, it is very similar to uh, a programming a sequential programming language of course um, uh, there is something called operator overloading which is related to synthesis but with whatever i have discussed uh, you can kind of grasp it then we will uh, go on with the fpgas then we will play with the tool and the case studies and that should kind of wind up you know put everything together and uh, uh, give you a complete picture of designing uh, the digital system practically and it will equip you uh, to to kind of start in the path of uh, uh, digital design i wouldn't say that that will kind of make you an expert uh, in the front end vlsi design or front end fpga design but that's a good starting point so that you can continue you can learn you can practice and do well so please uh, now uh, like we have covered almost two third part of the uh, the the course the last part is coming up so please review whatever we have done um, learn well i wish you all the best and thank you